Hello again. Um, today I have the pleasure of welcoming back James Roguski to the Zips Media stage. I've had the honor of um, joining him in recording interviews uh, about four or five times in the past. So it's uh, definitely exciting to have him back again. And during this time, he has been James, if you if you may not know of his work yet, he is a deep researcher and writer, speaker, author, and advocate and expert um, expert witness type, so subject expert anyway. And he's been working tirelessly on looking into the workings of the World Health Organization, sometimes in concert with the United Nations, but things seem to have gotten a little bit askew. And he is letting us know of a very urgent message that we all need to know about today. So first, if I may, James, I'd like to share a definition of health regulations. And first of all, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Great. Then um, I thought it might be interesting to read the definition of health regulations just to kind of set the tone today, which is health care regulations and standards are necessary to ensure compliance and to provide safe health care to every individual who accesses the system. Regulatory bodies protect health care consumers from health risks provide a safe working environment for healthcare professionals, and ensure that public health and welfare are served by health programs. Federal agencies implement public health laws passed by Congress through federal regulations. And today what we're gonna be focusing on are the international health regulations of 2005, provide an overarching legal framework that defines countries' rights and obligations in handling health public health events and emergencies that have the potential to cross borders. So that said, I'd like to share that I saw a video just yesterday, James, of a former senior medical officer of the WHO sharing his opinion that this organization has now become another captured agency. Uh, before they did noble deeds, gathering member countries together for the greater good, now they've seemed to have sold their soul to the usual global suspects and are now essentially doing their bidding. James, I'm wondering if you agree with this. Well, I think we're probably, uh, I had seen that same video. I think you must have been um, talking about doc, uh, Dr. David Bell. Um, and I, you know, I've spoken with him and, and we're on the same path and same direction in, in terms of what we believe. I, I think I agree with you know his statements very, very much. I thought he did a wonderful job of summarizing it. Um, in, in terms of regulations, that which you read, yes, exactly. And part of the problem is the word regulation, in my view, means to make regular, to set standards. And so in any communication, if you don't settle in on, well, what is it we're talking about? Uh, I've had conversations with people where I've asked them after the conversation, could you please write up or draw up what we just discussed? And, you know, verbally, we were totally simpatico, totally in agreement. But then I wrote up what I was seeing in my mind, and the other person wrote up what they were seeing in their mind, and we compared those notes, and they couldn't be more different. OK, and so part of the difficulty is if I look out the window of my my home here and I say, oh, I'm looking at a tree. And, you know, if you think in your mind of a tree, um, we're not thinking about the same thing. And so um, if I may read back to you, OK, some of the things that I want to talk about, and maybe we'll, we will we'll do it um, uh, in a more detailed way. Um, if I were to read Article 21 of the World Health Organization's Constitution, it says that the Health Assembly, now that's not the WHO, that's the World Health Assembly, which are 194 delegates to the WHO, they have, they, it says they sh shall have authority to adopt regulations concerning certain things. And they list five different categories. And so whether or not you want to accept that the WHO 
is actually legitimate and that something like the United States properly um, passed an amendment to our constitution to say, oh, we the people are going to give the WHO this authority, which you know did not happen. And, and so I dispute the fact that they do have such authority. I think that's an illusion. But if you accept what they're supposed to be doing based on what they want to believe, as far as thinking that their constitution gives them this authority, E on, on, on the list here, I'll go from the bottom up. It says that the health assembly would have the authority <clears throat> to adopt regulations concerning advertising and labeling of biological, pharmaceutical, and similar products that move in international commerce. Well, let me just talk about that one. I think it would be great if there were regulations controlling the labeling and advertising. Think about the blank inserts in the injections, which is part of labeling. And think about all of the government funded advertising telling people, encouraging people to get over their hesitation to inject some unknown substance into their body, okay? This is maybe a bad joke, but I've been making it over and over again, and it seems to resonate a little bit with people. I live in California, in the Los Angeles area, and I'm maybe 20 minutes from downtown LA. And there's an area of downtown LA where you know people, quite frankly, are down on their luck, homelessness, drug abuse, skid row, right? With the labeling on the injections that you could get if you went down to Skid Row and pulled up your sleeve and asked some random person on the street, do you have a hypodermic needle that you could stick something into my arm with? Well, it's not going to be labeled now, is it? Right? Well, if you then walked into a pharmacy and asked the pharmacist to stick something in your arm, the labeling isn't going to be all that much better. How in the world could anybody be expected to allow someone to inject? You know, I'll ask everybody here who, um, you know, maybe your audience is not uh, of the same mindset as the majority of people. But why would why would anybody allow someone to inject something into their body? Do you know what's in that vial? And an even more fundamental question, ask anybody you know who's allowed themselves to be jammed if they have the contact information, the name, the phone number, the email address of the person who jabbed them, you might as well go down to Skid Row and just take your chances because at least those drugs probably don't have DNA in them that is actually gonna change you. Yeah, you might get a poisonous substance and trip out or something, but you go into the pharmacy you're getting something that's not supposed to be in those products, but it's been demonstrated that the way they manufactured it, um, the running joke is, you know, they had one process to manufacture the uh, product that was used in the trial. And then another manufacturing process when they ramped up to make billions of them. So, you know, you were promised the vial in the trial, but you got a brew filled with poo. And, and so- Did not realize that. That is such a strong point. Okay. So it, it would be great if the World Health Organization could at least have a discussion about, well, what are the requirements? What are the regulations to govern advertising and labeling? All right. I'll work my way back up. Um, the Health Assembly shall have authority to adopt regulations concerning standards with respect to the safety, purity, and potency of biological, pharm pharmaceutical, and similar products moving in international commerce. Well, I'm gonna have to say they've failed miserably. We've seen people put out stuff like, you know, how bad is your batch? And, and studies that have shown people who got this batch maybe didn't have as many problems. People who got that batch didn't even seem like anything happened. People who got this batch had horrible, you know, death and disability and just horrible stuff. I, I used to work as a manager for a mom and pop urban nutrition store and the companies that we would order products from, I was the buyer, right? I would meet with the salespeople and I would decide what went on the shelf. And many of the companies, not all of them, but many of them 
would provide a um, independent laboratory analysis along with the shipment of their product. And the way this whole industry works is not that much different than nutraceuticals. A formulator makes or has an idea of, we, you know, we want to put this mixture of herbs or vitamins and minerals in a product. Well, they don't have a manufacturing plant to do that. So they contract with the manufacturer. And okay, great, you, you pick a wonderful manufacturer, but you verify that they're doing the job that they promised to do. You take a couple of bottles from their batch, you send it to your own independent you know, laboratory to be analyzed. And if they come back and it says, oh, you're supposed to have 50 milligrams of this and 80 milligrams of that. And they go, well, you know, it was 51 and 82. I was like, okay, you know, close enough, right? Um, where is the quality assurance independent laboratory analysis of the Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson products? Hey, WHO, it'd be great if you did such a thing. Um, they also have the authority to adopt regulations concerning diagnostic procedures. Well, I got to tell you that PCR thing is not a test. It's a process. And it's been used in a fraudulent fashion with up to a 97% false positive rate to create a case demic, you know, fear mongering. We've got all these cases, but do we really, or is it just the test that is flawed? Um, one more, and then um, I'll, I'll stop my, my rant here. Um, <laughs> one of the things that um, the WHO's working group for amendments is supposed to be negotiating this week, as we speak, October 2nd to the 6th, is something that they're authorized to talk about. Um, the Health Assembly shall have authority to adopt regulations concerning nomenclatures with respect to disease, cause of death, and public health practices. A fancy word for you know terms, nomenclature, words that words of art that they use in their in their discussions. Well, to my knowledge, to the best of my ability, nowhere in law is there a definition, a legal definition of the word vaccine. There's no definition of the word pandemic or case or um, safe or effective. Those words mean whatever the person using them wants to believe they mean. There's no legal definition. And so anytime you hear people using those words with some you know, pretend authority, um, just ask them, you know, can you show me the legal definition of a pandemic or a vaccine? Or what is the legal definition of safe? You keep, you know, you got to go back to the Princess Bride. I think it was Mandy Patinkin. You know, there's a scene where he says, well, you know, you keep using that word, but I don't think you know what it means. And you see that every once, once you realize that you should be looking for that, um, you realize that you see it everywhere. And so what's going on right now with the WHO is they're supposed to be negotiating for amendments to the international health regulations. So I'm very glad you started with that you know, definition. It'd be great if they got around to actually doing that, but we don't know what they're doing because it's all been done in secret. Um, 94 nations submitted 194 pages with over 300 proposed amendments on September 30th, 2022. So more than a year ago, and we have not seen an updated version. There's no second draft or third draft or you know version 2.0. Total secrecy. They're meeting this week in secret, but they here, here's the surprise that I don't think we've had a chance to talk about. On Monday morning, they met for an hour and a half. They usually have like their first session and it's public and they just say, Hey, how you doing? You know, here's an update on what here, here's an update on the meetings that we've been having in secret since we met the last time in secret, really? right? Uh, you can't make this up. And they let out a bombshell. And what they said was, well, you know, um, we don't think we're going to meet our deadline. They have a legal deadline in article 55 of the international health regulations that says, 
no wiggle room, you know, no stuttering, no, you know, mamby-pamby language. It says, if a nation wants to submit amendments to the international health regulations for consideration by the World Health Assembly in May, they have to do so four months in advance, which is mid-January. And they came out and said, it doesn't look like we're going to reach an agreement. It's just not just not going that great. But then they bring their lawyer on, Stephen Solomon, and they use a bunch of confusing gobbledygook language to try to explain how they don't have to follow their own rules. And so the last article that I published yesterday on my Substack, um, you know, the answer is no. If you don't meet your deadline to submit the package of amendments that you want everyone to consider four months, you know, in forward in May, then you missed your deadline. Sorry. You know, um, no, the answer is no. Oh, my heavens, James, that is a bombshell. And like, you know, where, where, mm, I mean, everywhere, even with parenting, if, you know, you give the, if this happens, these are the circumstances or, or the consequences that will come up. And wow, that is huge. That is just really huge. And I was going to my next question, which you pretty much covered very well, is where does this now stand? And mm -hmm. I was wondering if, if there have been much response from around the world coming in in support or opposition of these amendments so far. I understand New Zealand has are they supporting it? I believe they've signed that they are, for example. Well, every, well almost every nation has given lip service. Um, I'll shift gears and answer that question in, in this manner. Mm -hmm. um, there are several different tracks. And so the track that I was just talking about was something that I call track three because of how the deadlines all work out. And so to finish up with what I'm talking about, um, a year ago, many nations submitted a large number of amendments. They've been quietly being negotiated. So we don't have the foggiest idea of the status of whatever it is you know they're currently discussing because they're just keeping it secret. And apparently it's not all that put together because it's not ready to be presented. And so the schedule for that is they were meeting this week they're supposed to have meetings again, December 7 and 8, and they were hoping to submit it to an International Health Regulations Review Committee on the 15th of December to then be finally submitted to the WHO in mid-January. And so I thought we were going to get together and say, hey, you know, we need to have input into this process because by December 15th, you know, there's not going to be any more discussion, okay? And so that is still the case because it's just completely secret. Now, so that's one track, right? Those are the 300 plus amendments to the international health regulations. Another track, which is the deadline is upon us almost. Last year at the assembly, and most people are unaware that this even happened, a small set of amendments were adopted. And unfortunately, the vast majority of people have no idea that it happened. But if they even want to talk about it, they say, oh, well, you know, if the World Health Assembly adopts amendments to the regulations, the Senate will never approve them, right? Well, I got news for you. That's not how the process works. And we're right smack in the middle of it. So you don't have to believe me. You can read the evidence and see what's going on. The way it works is, Previous agreements, when the international health regulations were adopted in 1969 and in 2005, it was agreed that the process by which it would be amended doesn't require those amendments to go back to the nations for approval. You don't need to have parliament or Congress or the Senate give their advice and consent. You don't need the signature of a president or a prime minister or a king or a queen or a pope for that matter because they apply to the, the Holy See. It's assumed that if the WHO 
adopts amendments to change the international health regulations, it's assumed that you're okay with that unless the leader of your nation proactively rejects them. And so that's just not how people think it should work. And I agree, that isn't how it should work, but that is how it works. And so the amendments that were adopted last year have gone 16, more, a little bit more than 16 months now from the end of May of 2022, the deadline for every nation on the planet to reject them is December 1st. And if, if you can imagine, you know, I'm, I'm sure at some point in your life, you've procrastinated. I know I have, okay? All right, well, I, I guess I don't know you that well, you're different. <laughs> um, and, and, and so if you could structure something in your life that you got your way, if other people procrastinated, Wow, what a good system. Oh, I'm going to do something unless you stop me. No kidding. Right? Mm -hmm. Somebody has to get up and, and stop them. It's not the way people think it should be. Hey, we're going to do something. Are you okay with that? Right? No, you don't get to vote. You don't get to sign off on it. It's assumed because we agreed in the past. And, and this is really, in many ways, this is the core of the problem. If you agree to give somebody else the power to make decisions for you and they can make those decisions and now you're obligated to do whatever they decided on your behalf, that's a, that's a dumb move, right? Well, our forefathers have made a bunch of dumb moves. They got us involved into the international health regulations where a bunch of unknown, unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats in Geneva can make a decision. And if our politicians are then procrastinators and they just, the media doesn't talk about it, nobody says anything, time goes by, okay, great, you missed your chance. Now you have to do what we tell you, right? So the second track that I've been talking about is the amendments that were adopted last year that could be rejected by every nation on the planet by December 1st but nobody's talking about it, okay? Now, here's where my optimism kicks in because on what I've been calling the first track, which is, again, you know, and, and I know this is confusing. I've put it all on um, stoptheglobalagenda.com. There are four separate tracks. One of them's already passed and it kind of sort of ran off the rails for them, right? Good news for us, bad news for them to a certain degree. And this is the United Nations. They a year ago on September 2nd, 2022, set up a series of meetings from the 18th to the 22nd of September. So they're already over. And for the whole year, they were negotiating various declarations, United Nations Declaration on the Sustainable Development Goals, on pandemic prevention, on universal health care, and on tuberculosis. And so at the beginning of September, they spread those documents around to the ambassadors, you know, to the UN. And they entered into what they call the silence procedure. And what that means is they said, well, here's what our declaration is going to be. And you don't have to do anything. If you just don't do anything, we'll take that as your agreement. Silence is consent. Any nation could step up and say, no, no, you know, I don't agree. Well, there were 11 nations that on the day before the meetings were supposed to start, delivered a joint letter to the president of the um, UN's General Assembly. And they said, nope, we're not going for it. We don't agree. And they said, we don't appreciate you pretending at this relatively informal meeting that you're speaking for the United Nations. They said, this has to go before the General Assembly in a full-on official session. And, and, and the point is, they knew the rules. The delegates from the, or the ambassador or whatever from these nations knew the rules. And they just sent a letter to the president of the General Assembly and said, look, um, you're going to have to follow the rules. 
And so what they did was a nice theatrical production. They gaveled the meeting into session and immediately went to the order of business that you would have expected. Well, they're going to talk all day long about, you know, what they believe with this declaration. And then somewhere in the middle or towards the end, they'll take a vote and, and you know, they'll um, adopt it or reject it or whatever. That's not what they did at all. Right out of the gate. They said, okay, well, we're talking about this amendment and you guys have seen it for, you know, since the beginning of the month and we trust that you're all fine with it. And so subject to the fact that, you know, we're going to have to take this up again at the United Nations General Assembly, it's been adopted. It's like, if, if, if you were five minutes late to the meeting, you would have missed the meat of the meeting. And then you wonder what in the heck is going on. Okay. It's all theater. Okay. And then you read the media and not too many people are reporting about it because quite frankly, they got crushed. These 11 nations stood up and said no. And so they did what they had to do, but then they try to spin it and they try to make it sound like it's so wonderful, which is what they're trying to do with what we started off talking about. And so the fourth track of what's going on is what most people are a little bit aware of this thing called a pandemic treaty. Well, that name in and of itself is wrong. It's not really a treaty that has a very specific meaning. When people think of a treaty, they think, well, um, you put a bunch of words on paper, you agree to them, you sign off on them and that's it. Well, what they're trying to negotiate is actually called the WHO CA plus. It's a convention agreement. And that's not what people think it is, right? It's a, an agreement where if you were signing a contract with somebody and they came along and they said, well, let me put a couple of dozen sheets of blank paper in the contract and we'll get a group of people together later to fill in the blanks. Um, you don't necessarily get to pick who they are and you don't get to say anything about what they want to fill it in with. So just sign here and agree to that process. Okay, that's crazy. That's certifiably crazy. But that's what they're trying to negotiate. And they've done it before, back in 1992 at the UN, all of the nations signed on to the framework convention for climate change. And so if you wonder why things are so crazy, it's because this conference of the parties this bureaucracy has been meeting year after year after year, and they decide whatever the heck it is they want to decide. And you already pretty much signed a blank contract so that whatever they say, you're obligated to do. Well, you know, that's insane. But, you know, we're dealing with insane people who want to control you. And if they can get our leaders to agree, then they get to say, well, you know, you agreed to it. You agreed to let us control your life. And, you know, I don't agree. I don't think you agree. Um, the answer is no. I, I, I love that. And um, I I got so much out of a, an interview you recently did with Dr. Uh, John Campbell. And um, I have so many questions here. I know we could go on for a long time, but I did want to ask you, James, in your opinion, do you think this might be a tactic or an excuse to centralize power by the who, would you say? Um, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. That was probably too easy for you. So how about this one? Since I know we could go on for a long time and you're we're wanting to be respectful of people's time that, um, and I wanted to ask you if you have any final thoughts, but in your ideal world, what ending would you write for this scenario? Well, you know, um, every individual person has the right to make their own health decisions, okay? And, you know, a healthy respect for that individuality because there is no cookie cutter, oh, everybody should do this, right? Um, there's a word that's used often that I object to in natural health world, um, which is homeostasis. I don't really like that word. It means everybody's the same all the time and it's stagnant, right? Dynamic equilibrium or ever-changing balance, 
think about um, a skateboard or somebody surfing or skiing or snowboarding or even riding a bicycle or for that matter, walking, okay? Um, every step, every little move, you, you got to shift a little this way. You got to shift a little that way. If you start falling too far, you got to do something you know dramatic to bring you back. But you want to be able to go with the flow and maintain balance, okay? Nobody in Geneva can possibly know what's best for you on any given day. And so for them to say, you got to do this and you got to do this and you got to do this. Oh, you've got to have a vaccine certificate and a um, prophylaxis certificate and a testing certificate and a recovery certificate if you want to travel, right? This is one of the things that they're supposed to be negotiating this week. I don't even know how you could begin to say that a vaccine certificate with an injection that says, you know, yes, you got the injection, but the studies show that you're now more likely to be sick. You're more likely to have damage to your immune system. It doesn't stop transmission of whatever that vaccine vaccine was for. To get a vaccine certificate or a testing certificate or any of these other things, it only certifies that you're compliant. And, oh, if you're willing to give up your freedoms and your rights and do crazy things to your body, then they will let you move about the planet. Um, that is not the world. You know, you asked me what scenario. Um, I, I plan on living in a world where individual, individual people have the freedom to live their life. I, I learned back in 10th grade government class, you know, that our nation was founded on the idea that you have the freedom to do and be whoever you want to be. You can't infringe upon anybody else's freedoms and neither can they infringe upon yours. And so, you know, do I have the right um, to force somebody to inject something under their skin? Do I have the right to tell somebody that, you know, they have to stay in their home? I don't have that right and neither did they. And, and so a healthy respect for you know individual freedoms and rights and and an awareness that I, I can't tell you what's right for you and you have to do it any more than you could tell me and so you know my running joke is i suffer from a terminal illness called james Ruguski syndrome as far as i know um you know i've had it my whole life and at some point, it's probably going to get the best of me, and I'm managing it to the best of my ability. And so if I if I were to go to a doctor, which I don't do, and and they said, oh, you have this, that, or the other disease. I'm like, no, you're getting me confused with Mr. Alzheimer or Mr. Parkinson or Mr. Bell or you know whoever else. I, I'm pretty darn sure I've got James Ruguski syndrome. So if you're going to treat me and help me understand what I need now to bring myself into balance, then I'd be happy to work with you. But you know what? Um, there isn't an insurance code. There isn't a WHO ICD code um, for James Raguski syndrome. So they can't help me because they're not going to get reimbursed for actually treating me. They have to put me into a cubbyhole and pretend to treat me by renaming whatever I've got going on to, to make it be that, you know, oh, if we if we say he's got this, then we can do that to him. If we say he's got this other thing, then we can do some other stuff to him. And if you don't think that they know which one of those diagnoses makes them more money, then you're just not paying attention. OK, well, if you find a practitioner who asks you 100 questions and says, you know, what's going on with you? Um, how can we best treat you? Well, work with that practitioner. And in my perfect world, and these are things that I'm working towards, people come to the awareness that the system doesn't give a crap about them. The system takes them and turns them into a money-making product. And so I've long referred to pharmaceutical drugs and jams as customer, and, and not to mention the testing, um, those are customer acquisition tools. They take healthy people, they stick something up their nose or do some other kind of test, and they use a bunch of propaganda to scare the daylights out of that person to make them think that, oh, you're, you know, you have to swallow this poison, pharmaceutical drug, 
or you have to take this jab or you're going to die. And so people take the poison or they take the jab and then they become a lifelong customer because now they're dealing with and you know an iatrogenic a, a doctor caused disease and you know arguably now the statistics are unknowable but for decades it's been known that properly prescribed pharmaceutical drugs were the third leading cause of death the statistics are unknowable but you know i think it's gone to the top of the list it's almost impossible now to know are, are people ill and dying because of a unique something with them or is it because they're being murdered and you know you might as well go to um skid row and take your luck you know take your chances with some unknown substance from some drug pusher or you could go to the pharmacy and do the same thing that that's such an important analogy and i'm glad that, that you put it that way you know and i posted there's memes out there um you know that anything that has to be coerced or incentivized or uh, made, you're made to feel smaller or less than or selfish that you're not protecting everyone by wearing a face diaper for lack of better word <laughs> that you know they it's clear they don't have our best interest at heart so i'm glad that that you're sharing this and as I'm sure you're familiar with the term mass formation psychosis, mm -hmm. that, you know, after this time that there are so many of us mm -hmm. and it's sad to observe that so many of us, we were almost many of us are, are comfortable in our in our fear that, you know, we are have a little cartoon where this mass person says, I'm scared. And another person yeah. holds up a document and says, I have information to show how and why you should not be scared. And so the masked man sets fire to it. And he says, I don't want to know. I want to be scared. And it almost comes down, I think, what I've observed, that that's kind of what's out there. What do you think, James? Um, you know, you're saying something in a different way that I've been saying. And, you know, someone who has maybe studied the biochemistry of it, there seems to be an addictive nature to fear, right? A, a lot of people maybe um, abuse drugs because, you know, there's a disassociation if you're drunk or inebriated or high or something like that, you know, disassociating from society. But there almost seems to be um, some kind of addictive nature to that status of being in fear, um, uh, you know, there's there's the argument, you know, people have heard of the fight or flight mechanism, but it's really, there's a third one and that's freeze. You know, some animals, like I've seen videos of goats when they get scared, they just fall over and they're sort of paralyzed for a little bit um, or playing possum or, you know, the deer that freezes when he sees the headlights coming towards them. Many people are in that frozen state. They're scared and, and they just don't do anything, right? And, and so some people fight, some people run, and, and sometimes those are the proper things to do. Uh, but the better thing, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've noticed and I've been commenting on the uh, last uh, line of the first verse of the Star Spangled Banner is over the land or the land of the free and the home of the brave. But the home of the brave has been just bombarded by fear mongering. And, and so if you're watching something, mainstream news or alternative information or whatever it might be, you don't want to have your head in the sand and not know that maybe there's something going on out there that you know could be a problem for you. You, you want to be informed, but you don't want to be you know frozen from fear because of you know this dystopian world that's being described to you. And so I have an issue with a lot of alternative media that is just making people so afraid that they give up. It's like, oh, there's nothing I can do. Well, let me, I'm here to tell you, there's always something you can do. It's an infinite list of things. Everybody can do a little certain something different. If you have a bucket and you keep dripping in it, eventually it's going to fill up and start overflowing. And so easiest job for anybody to do is to, you know, take the link to this video and just share it. If you don't, then you're functioning as a sensor. 
if you find any information that is of value and you share it with everybody, um, you're doing something, right? Now you never know, you know, the butterfly that flaps its wings in the Amazon forest sets off a, a series of events that, you know, creates a storm across the world. Do something, whatever it does that makes sense to you. It could be as easy as sharing this video, going somewhere to learn some more information. You know, I've published an awful lot of stuff on jamesroguski.substack.com. Learn whatever it is you want to learn, but then you can actually be the media. You have, you have a phone, you have a camera, you know somebody who does. Speak whatever it is you want into, you know, video camera and audio or write it on paper and, you know, put it in a document and share it with everybody. You never know where you might tell somebody who tells somebody who tells somebody who tells a lot of people. And then it gets to somebody who knows somebody and they get in the door to tell somebody who can, you know, actually make a bigger change. But if you're silent because you're scared or you're you're giving up, um, that's not going to have an impact. And so whenever I hear people say, oh, there's nothing you can do, that's just not true. And, and so it's easy to procrastinate and do nothing. And the way the WHO and the UN and everybody, they're all set up, they have it structured so that your silence is taken as your consent. And so, you know, we've got deadlines coming up. We've, we kind of sort of derailed the United Nations thing. It's looking like the amendments that, you know, they're trying to negotiate are derailing themselves. You know, they're having trouble meeting their deadlines. Just keep pushing, just keep pushing. And so I invite everybody to give me a call. My phone number is 310-619-3055. And I've written hundreds of articles with all kinds of information on jamesroguski.substack.com. And, you know, there's so much more. On one level, though, it's really very simple. These people are trying to negotiate the future rules of the world without your input. If you're okay with that, then, you know, go lay back down on the couch, go to sleep and don't say anything. Um, if you want to have a say, then get involved, learn more. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Give me a call. Speak up and say what it is you want. And at least put that drop in the bucket of manifesting the world that you want to live in rather than the world that they're telling you, you know, they have planned for you. I plan on living for a long time and it's not going to be in the world that they're designing, right? Um, it's going to be in the world that you and I and everybody else come together and unite and show our courage to set a path out into the future that is, you know, better than what's going on right now. It might get worse before it gets better. But, you know, ultimately, if you just keep speaking the truth and stand up for, you know, what it is you believe, we'll get there and we'll get there together. Wonderful, James. I appreciate that. I was going to ask you if you would summarize where we are right now in your opinion. I believe you've done that beautifully. And I did want to mention that we will I'll be including in the show notes uh, your contact information that you're so generous to share, links to your Substack, uh, the link to your interview with um, Dr. John Campbell, I thought was wonderful, and um, anything like that. And, and I'd like to also say, please, if you uh, be uh, believe this uh, James message is worthy, Please share it as far and wide as you can to help expand the reach and give us a like so you'll know when we're coming on again. And thank you so much for your time. And James, I we really appreciate you. You're just uh, a hero, but beyond measure. And thank you for your tireless commitment and dedication to this important work. And we're, we're counting on your living a long time too. So <laughs> thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye for now.